talked about, basically we introduced this problem, like measurement-induced entanglement phase transition. We have a random unitary circuit, and randomly perform projective measurements, and its associated class of measurements, consider the individual trajectory separately, each trajectory calculate half chain entanglement entropy or whatever sufficiently large subsystems and average over different trajectory and average over different unitaries and then the claim is that there's a phase transition. Okay, so we introduce a phenomenology and we introduce a subtlety. You know, uh, if you talk about uh, competitions between entanglement productions by unitary and entanglement destruction by measurement, this naive picture does not give us really desired competition that leads to the phase transition because in this naive calculation and naive intuitions, the measurement always wins in a sense that measurement happens over everywhere, but entanglement generation happens only on the boundary. That's the recap. In my second lecture, I wanted to become a little more technical so that we learn some real technical tools that we can potentially utilize once you go back home and then do your own research project. So that's my aim. The objective is the second objective that I, I wanted to talk about, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, uh, that I mentioned in the beginning of uh, first lecture. So let's recap this naive model, very naive model. Let me just clarify one particular aspect. We previously said, okay, entanglement change will be entanglement change due to random unitary circuit, and entanglement reduction by measurement, and this is order one for 1D because it only happens on the boundary. This is order, maybe some entanglement density, if you like, defined, and this is what I'm going to say wrong, but let me just write it anyway. And the number of measurements on average that's performed on the subsystem, and because they are completely disentangled, this is entanglement reduction. So setting this equal to zero implies that entanglement density has to scale as one over NA. Therefore, in the sufficiently large system size, entanglement density has to go to zero. And we do not have any phase transition in this picture. And I explain using a particular circuit, you know, namely, we start from a product plus state and then consider applying control the phase gauge here and there, and then perform measurements in X basis. And I showed you that before the measurement, this is maximally entangled between this qubit and the rest, but even after the measurement, still it's maximally entangled because even though the middle one is disentangled, now the first one is entangled with the third one. What's happening is when you perform measurement here, this qubit used to be entangled with maybe second one or some combination of a second or third one. But when you disentangle the second one, this information is actually teleported, the exact quantum teleportation mechanism, such a way that now it's entangled with the third one. And that's generically what's going to happen in a complex chaotic dynamics. We can engineer the dynamics so that this, is, this happens exactly, and that's the notion of quantum error correction. But what's interesting is in generic chaotic dynamics, similar phenomena happens. Therefore, what's wrong about this argument is this, point, this connection. Even if you perform measurement, you shouldn't think of it as you know, killing the local observables or local measure, you know, local parameters. Rather, this is a non-local behavior that we should be very careful. And the lesson of this example is, okay, basically we need new theoretical framework to understand this type of behavior, especially if you want to study the critical behavior or the behavior at the criticalities and understand the universalities uh, or extract some universal behavior, large scale behavior, or even write down the field theoretic description. Maybe Sebastian will be able to elaborate that on more uh, later. We do need new framework that's different from the conventional one. And that's going to be the topic of today's lecture. So I'm going to first provide a broad overview but of what I'm going to do for the rest of the time. Okay. So the overview is the following. We are going to map our own problem into a classical, uh, uh, classical spin, uh, step mang model so that the solving the step mang model is basically solving our problem. 
and we will we'll introduce this mapping and uh, correspondence. And this mapping will be done, will be accomplished through four steps. The step number one is going to be that uh, initially we talked about this average entanglement. So for subsystem A, the average entanglement is defined by averaging over unitary and then averaging over different measurement outcome for a specific choice of unitary of entanglement entropy of subsystem obtained by this wave function. Okay? But instead of considering this, especially we talked about the von Neumann entanglement entropy, uh, instead of considering this, we'll introduce new quantity. New quantity. So I'm going to just write it as S A superscript N bar. It's just a name. I didn't say anything about this. But I'm going to design this object such a way that A, it's easy to, easier to calculate because otherwise it's meaningless. And B, it has a property so that if I take limit, so I'm going to have a series of quantities n enumerated by n equals 2, 3, 4, all the way to infinity and well defined for the integer numbers of n larger than 1. And we define this quantity in such a way that if I take the limit that n goes to 1 and then evaluate this quantity, this becomes equals to S A bar. Okay, we'll introduce a quantity that follows this. So the argument is even though this is well defined only for the integer values of n larger than one, maybe our physical behavior can be understood by analytic continuation of this function by extending this definition of n even for the regimes with that's not explicitly defined. Okay? Then we are going to hopefully solve stem -A problem associated with HN. Each N will give you different classical spin, mo spin model. If we solve all models and extract the critical point for all every N, and then again take the analytic continuation of N. The disclaimer, we won't be able to do that. Turns out in the most desired situations, we have a qubit systems, random unitaries, when n equals two, we can carry out almost everything almost exactly. Actually, exactly. But when n is larger than two, calculation seems to become trickier and then harder. So we won't be able to extract all the desired properties. But if you take a certain limit, for example, instead of qubit, since the qdit, where the local Hilbert dimension is not two, but the d dimensions, and then take the limit d goes to infinity, turns out we can actually carry out this calculation exactly and then extract the critical point for every single n and then do the analytic continuation. That's doable. However, that's not exactly what we want because local Hilbert dimension is too large. That's not what we want. That's because it often neglects important contribution from the quantum fluctuations. So that's what it is. But we are, our approach is to introduce this one, and that's going to the stem number one. And this idea is called the replica trick. And step number two is going to be tensor network. Now that our goal is to evaluate this new quantity, turns out we can write down a tensor network diagrams that represent some important quantities that let you evaluate this n. Okay, so that quantity z, I'm going to just call it z of n and bar. So if I know this, I can also calculate this. That's going to be a relation, and I will explain that. And <clears throat> we will evaluate this as contraction of some tensor network. So there are many you know, lines and tensors at the intersection of the lines and some boundary tensors, such a way that if I evaluate the contraction of these many tensors, then I'll evaluate this value. Once I evaluate this value, I can compute this. That's going to be the case. Okay? This tensor network is nothing but diagrammatic representations of contraction of many different matrices, but we will find it useful. What I'm going to do is two steps within this step number two. First, 
I'm going to draw a tensor network diagram that represents the desired quantity for individual particular instance of U and the particular measurement outcomes M. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to average over all unitary measurement outcome without evaluating the diagram. And that's the beauty of this approach. If you're given a particular set of unitary, it's randomly chosen unitary, and contracting this large scale tensor network is computationally very heavy, and it's not possible. In fact, there's a comp computer science results where contracting this type of large scale tensor network is prohibitively large, it's exponentially large, not only in memory, but also in computation time. But the beauty is, once you have a good structure and average over unitary, we can average it out, the diagrammatic level itself, and get the new tensor network diagram, so another tensor network diagram different from the previous one. And now this guy, now the average over unitary and summed over M, this measurement outcome weighted by PM, this is insensitive to the particular measurement outcome for a particular choice of unitary because it has been already averaged out. We are talking only on the average behavior. Okay? So this tensor network, we get a new tensor network that's kind of universal. It only depends on the geometry of the circuit or the parameters such as Q, which is a measurement rate. Okay? So we get a new tensor network diagram. And then we'll see that this diagram actually corresponds to the diagram that you would obtain if you want to write down the partition function diagram for the classical spin model. And it will show this is actually partition function of classical spin model. For every n, for different choice of n, we'll get the cla different classical spin models. And this diagram is nothing but evaluating the, you know, Boltzmann uh, weight and then summing over all different configurations. Okay. And that's step number three actually. So averaging over unitary. Uh, and then finally step number four, you just provide the interpretation. We solve the problem and provide a, you know, get the results. Uh, and interpret the data. Interpret the results from the classical spin model. So to do that, we need to understand what quantities in the classical spin model corresponds to what quantities in our random unitary circuit and measurements. Any questions so far? Why? Um, because that's what we do in order to solve the problem, right? So it's not, th this mapping, we have to remember that this mapping is something not somebody asked me to do, but I do it so the convenience for me, right? So I make it classical, I, I'll, I'll try hard until it's classical. So that's why it's classical. Yeah, there's no fundamental reasons, yeah. Uh, but I, there's a different fundamental reasons. Like here we are averaging over unitary first, and we talked about dynamics of how correlation propagates in a particular geometry. And that dynamics is not necessarily experiencing interference. And that's why you can map to the classical dynamics. Okay? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Turns out it'll not be, it'll be okay in this our case because we will draw the diagram such a way that when we perform the averaging, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so they do not, they affect each other. Yeah, so that's another non-trivial thing. So when you perform the averaging, we basically average individual components of the tensor network diagram separately without contracting. So we'll never, at some point, at never, and in never, at any point, we are going to evaluate this number PM. That's not what we are going to do. Just average over the diagrams. Cool, yep.
That's a very good point. So if I get a solution for classical SP model, is the universality class of this VH condition the classical SP model basically the universality class of this random, you know, entanglement entropy model? No. The reason being, if you want to compute precisely this particular quantity, we need to take the replica limit that n goes to one. However, for each n, the critical point is different and the universality point is different. So what we want to do is we want to figure out the universality class of the limit that n goes to one. And that's not always easy. And actually, it's very hard, it seems. So we are trying, I mean, that's open problem at the moment, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Could you speak up loud a bit? Why should? No, these quantities are not Rennie entropy. It'll, it'll look similar. I'm going to present the equation. It'll look similar. It's not Rennie entropy. Uh, maybe I can explain it later. Okay? Individual n is not exactly the same as this guy. And these are not Rennie, not average Rennie entropy. It's slightly different. And that subtlety actually makes some big difference. Okay. That's right, that's right. The reason why we can do the averaging is because it's a random unitary circuit. And that, that's what random give, unitary circuit gives us. We have a, we can characterize random unitary circuit ensemble very well. We know their average, we know their variance, we know all the statistical moments at the tensor network diagram level. That's what allows us to evaluate this exactly. If you have not chosen how random unitary circuit, but some other random unitary circuit or some ensemble of circuits, we could evaluate, in principle, do this. It's not clear whether the final outcome is going to be useful or not, because here we ended up getting classical spin model with a very physical intuition that we can play with. But that's not gonna be the case if you average over different ensemble. So choosing a good ensemble so that we get a good, you know, like interpretable classical spin model is going to be a, like, that's going to be the art. Okay, did I answer your question? It also depends on the geometry, but not really for depending on the like, value of n. Yeah, but that, that I mean, like, I, I think I'm, I, I'm just providing the overview, so maybe the, we can talk about the details. So you had other questions? I'll talk about it later. So like, this is the well, overview strategy, I think it's clear. Okay, okay, cool. And then, I'll be honest, I'll be worried that I won't be able to finish this whole lecture within time, so I'm going to tell you the results first, okay? So if you do this whole calculus and procedures, you will get classical spin model, and for the special case, so let, let's just go to the results. So let's take the special case of n equal two. We'll get a particular spin model, and that's going to be Ising spin model. We will have different sites on a triangular lattice. And then these particles will be interacting. They'll be interacting for every ones like that. And then they will in fact have Ising symmetry. Uh, they have Ising symmetry, so you can understand uh, uh, this whole thing as a partition, you know, the, you can talk about the partition function Z of the spin model, which is going to be summing over all classical variables. So they, they have uh, classical variables associated with them. I'm going to call them sigma. A sigma could take a value plus minus one. Every dot here can be plus minus one. So we are going to sum over all configurations of sigma. And for a given configuration, this whole thing will give you a Boltzmann factor, and that's going to be the product of the Boltzmann factors coming from individual Boltzmann factors, okay? Because it's going to be the summation of the terms in the Hamiltonian, in the exponent. But here it's a, some Boltzmann factor. 
but it's easier to write down interaction as a three-body interaction, even though I know it will be factorized to the pairwise interaction because it's isensymmetric. Product over all triangles. Boltzmann weight associated with particular triangle for sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. So consider this particular sigma uh, triangle, and we have a you know, classical variable sigma 1 and sigma 2, sigma 3, and depending on their relative configurations, we will have uh, some Boltzmann factor. Okay? And you multiply all those Boltzmann factor for every upside down triangle, and then there will be global Boltzmann factor, and then we sum over all different configuration of sigma. And that, that's the, the, you know, uh, the partition function. And this partition function is going to be the, the object that we are going to talk about. Okay? And then we will see that this object that you want to evaluate is going to be the free energy difference of the following two situations. We consider two cases. Case one, where you have this spin model, you know, spins, and on the bottom, the spins have the open boundary conditions. At the top, we have a fixed boundary condition where all the classical spins are pinned to all the positive configuration. So consider putting extra layer of classical spin variables, and those are not variables that are constant, and that's pinned to be positive. That's case number one, and we can evaluate the Boltzmann factor, or the, the partition function of them, and that's Z. Okay, I just define Z to be the partition function of this case. And case two, I basically have the same spin model, spin model, and then the same open boundary. However, we have a different boundary conditions. On the top, we divide into the two parts, A and A bar, such a way that on the A bar, we have a pinned boundary condition where everything is you know, pinned to be positive configurations, but everything within A is pinned to negative configuration. And that one defines the partition function ZA. It depends on the choice of subsystem A. Okay? The size of the, the width of this spin model is going to be the number of qubits, and the height of the spin model, this, the one plus, this 2 this spin model, is going to the depth of the circuit, and this A is obviously the choice of the subsystem for our uh, circuit model for which we want to compute the entanglement, okay? Once we get the partition function, we can evaluate the free energy associated with them. That's going to be a minus log of partition function. And we also have a free energy for A minus log of the partition function. And then we evaluate the difference in the free energy. Delta F, which is F A minus F. And that's going to be our quantity S A of two average. Okay? So this is a special case for N equal two. We believe basically the same thing or very similar thing will happen for the large N, but there are technical subtleties and difficulties. So we are not going to talk about too much, but believe similar things will happen. Quantitative agreement is difficult to achieve because, as I said, we eventually need to take n goes to 1. However, we'll learn some intuitive picture of what's going on already with this picture. Okay? Further, <clears throat> now we tune the Q, which is a uh, like frequency, basically likelihood of performing measurement. Right? In some sense, that's the only remaining parameter. Because right? we have average over unit. Actually, there are exactly two uh, uh, parameters that control this, this model, uh, aside from locality and geometry. One is this Q. The other one is local Hilbert space dimension, which assumed to be two, because we are assuming qubit model instead of qubit model, okay? But, so Q and D are the two parameters that control this model. But let's consider the fixed case in D equal two. So we can talk about what happens as you tune Q, and the outcome is going to be Q much larger than QC is going to be T larger than TC 
for ferromagnetic to the paramagnetic the, or the disorder phase transition in the spin motor. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention this, this classical spin motor will be ferromagnetically interacting spin motor with the uh, Z2-izing symmetry. So it has a finite temperature phase transition, it's 2D, and that phase transition temperature is TC. So when measurement rate is sufficiently large, larger than the critical point, then our temperature is going to be larger than the critical point. And the measurement rate it's much less than QC, or just less than, it's just QC, and then that corresponds to T less than TC. And in the for, first case, we have a disorder phase, or paramagnetic phase, and in the case, we have an ordered phase. Ferromagnetically ordered phase, okay? So what happens? When we are in the ordered phase, because we are pinning the boundary Basically, that breaks the symmetry, and the entire box system will pin to be positive configuration. Everything will be rigidly, you know, ferromagnetic. It could be all up, all positive, or all negative. But due to the boundary, it will be all positive. Okay. In the case two, it's a little subtle, because this part is all positive, this part is all negative, and it's ferromagnetically ordered. So it's a, there's a frustration. There's a domain wall here. So what's going to happen is Basically, everything is minus here, and everything is positive here. And this domain wall has to move around and maybe choose some path like that, or maybe to the right, whatever the path. And different path will give you different free energy cost. Because in the ordered phase, as long as you have a domain wall, this domain wall costs free energy. Therefore, the difference in the free energy will be basically the length of the domain wall in the leading order, okay? If the system size is very deep and subsystem size is sufficiently large, this length will be basically proportional to the length of the subsystem. Therefore, free energy difference will be proportional to the volume of A in the ferromagnetic phase. So therefore, this order phase in the RUC model where it corresponds to uh, volume line entangled phase. On the other hand, if the measurement rate is so frequent, we just don't take them very much, corresponding spin model has a high temperature, and the spins are disordered. So even though you are pinning the top boundary to be the all positive, effect of the top boundary will deteriorate and then you know, attenuate as you go into the bulk, and majority of the bulk will be 50-50 random plus and minus. It'll fluctuate a lot due to thermal fluctuations. Therefore, if you have different boundary condition, it doesn't matter. The bulk is going to be just dominated by plus minus. And then domain wall will not cost so much energy. In other words, this order phase is basically the condensation of the domain walls. So domain wall doesn't cost too much energy or at most it you know, comes from some corrections coming from near the top. So it's independent of the choice of subsystem sizes because it'll terminate within some length scale size, okay? So in this case, free energy cost will be order one and therefore we'll have area law or the boundary law uh, of scaling. Yes? Oh yeah, so this screen is not working. I don't know what's going on. Oh, actually I see it from here. So, I don't know how we can turn on the screen. Yeah, can you turn on this screen so that? So in this monitor actually, I see the camera is following me. But I think this screen is just not on. In the meantime, like any, any questions, yes. And sorry? Oh, um, I'll, I'll answer that later, yeah.
think that I also answer because I'm going to go into the details of how we derive this. I think there will be answers. So but any, any any other questions about? Yeah. Okay, sure. So <clears throat> after mapping to spin model, if you have measurement rate that's sufficiently large, you will see it'll translate to the temperature that's high for the classical spin model. Therefore, your spins are just disordered. It will be like plus minus like random. So if you compute the free energy for two different cases and take the difference, it will be very small because different boundary condition doesn't imply too much. The bulk spin will be plus minus random. That's in contrast to the volume null case where due to the ordering, pinned boundary will just dictate the whole configurations. Here it's frustrating because you have a, you know, on the boundary, you don't know whether it's plus or minus one. You have to have a domain wall that propagates through the bulk. That's what's happening, yeah. That's a very interesting question. That will have, start to happen when n is larger than two. n equal three, you will see that it's not just Ising model, but we have a more internal state. And you could have a different symmetry breaking. Here we only have Ising symmetry, so that's the only way you can break the symmetry. But n equal larger than two, there will be different ones. As far as I know, it's not completely understood what are the tuning parameters for the different types of terms. Here we only have one parameter, Q. But you could consider like different symmetry breaking in principle. You're right, yeah. yeah. No, like uh, to answer, like if it's three, it's a three factorial, so it's S three. So we have a permutation group of three. So we have a six element because it's three factorials, yeah. Um, let me tell you just one thing before I move on. So I told you that this height is basically depth, T, and the uh, width, is the number of qubits n, right? We can ask what's going to happen in the ordered side, so volume side, when the depth is not sufficiently deep, okay? In that case, this domain wall could actually not propagate to the side, but actually it's better to propagate straight down because the length of the domain wall will be actually shorter for that configuration than this configuration if the depth is sufficiently low, right? This free energy difference will be dictated by the dominant term, the dominant, you know, like, you know, all the whatever that they minimize the free energy difference. So the typical configuration will be indeed what has a domain wall in the third domain, right? And if you increase the depth, at some point, the height will become similar to the width, and then you may want to actually have a domain wall to the side. But when you want to go to the side, you can either go to the left and to the right. If A is smaller than A bar, it's better go to the left because that's shorter. A is larger than A bar, like more than half, it will go to the right because that's shorter, right? So basically, we want to draw the domain wall that's the shortest and satisfy the boundary conditions, the shortest cut, okay? And that coincides with our big, you know, expected behavior of the entanglement. So remember in the volume null phase, we see the linear increase and then saturate. And that's reproduced. If the time is sufficiently short, shallow, you develop domain wall, top and bottom, and that domain wall length or the free energy cost will linearly increase with time. And that's this linear increase. But once it reaches a certain point, it's better to go either to the left and to the right and then saturate the value. If the subsystem size A is less than half, it will dictate by the size of A half. And free energy cost per domain wall length will define basically this alpha tilde value. The alpha value times N. So this picture of time and entanglement plot can be reproduced for the volume null phase. Also for the area level phase, it's kind of trivial, but this is also reproduced. So we can study how the entanglement grows. In fact, this picture is true already when Q is equal to zero. That means it's a perfectly ordered phase. And this is true. And in fact, 
historically that was done before this measurement interface transition you know, uh, was discovered. And there was the way to understand how the entanglement entropy in many body interacting system grows linearly on average uh, in the generic quantum dynamics. Yes, I'm kind of doing it in reverse. Yeah, if you have a spatially periodic boundary condition, you just wrap it around and you get the same classical spin model. It, and the domain wall now will be of this form. Yes? I don't think that's possible, but that's interesting direction. I mean, I, I would encourage you to think about it, but uh, my, my immediate reaction is like it may be difficult, yeah. Tell me if you could, because I mean, it, it might be possible, I just don't know. Any other question? Okay, then let's get into the details. Let, let, me, um, let me actually tell you how to derive all those things using tensor network diagrams. And to do that, first I'll review the tensor network diagram very briefly. Okay, don't be scared. The tensor network diagram is literally drawing diagrams to represent array of numbers, okay? For example, suppose I want to represent a quantum state psi, and you can think of it as ci, some coefficients in some basis, basis state i, or in my mind, I always think of like this as an array of vectors. Maybe the maximum number is like the d, okay? So I'm going to represent this array as a, some diagram that has one box or circle with a leg attached to it. The fact that it has one leg means this is a one-dimensional array. This array index i will run through one uh, uh, from, the, uh, from one to d, okay? Let's consider the quantum state, you know, describing bipartite system, part A and part B. The wave function can be written as ij, cij, and I for the basis state over A, and J for the basis state of part B, okay? Now, this is a two-dimensional array. You can think of Cij as a matrix, right? And this matrix will be represented by some box or circle, it doesn't matter, where it's running over I, one through D, and J, one through D, and we have a two index. And in, in some sense, there is no distinction because we can always define the composite index, i, comma, j, and treat them as this one index, and they write it in this way. So we should understand that whenever there's a single lag running from one through d, we can split it into two lags running from one through d1 and one through d2, when d, d1 times d2 equals to d, okay? So we have some kind of flexibility there, okay? So we talked about state, but we can also represent the operator, say, density matrix rho, it's explicitly operator. This is like sum over ij, rho ij, i and j. This is very similar to this guy. And we can draw the diagram that looks like rho. We have i and j. So in some sense, the same diagram, just wrote rho. It's not so important. Okay? One downside of this approach is this diagram and this diagram is basically the same, just like some object with the two legs. So we do not distinguish whether this is a bra vector or the cat vector. So we need to keep track of that in our mind. However, in some sense, that's the beauty of this. We have some flexibility of describing, you know, you know, the different observables without having to worry about these two too much. But however, we need to make sure things are correct. Okay, okay a couple of more examples. If you consider the identity matrix, that's basically delta ij, i and delta j. And these kind of operators I can represent as a line, the J and I. So in this tensor network diagram, the convention is whenever a line, basically the top and bottom index has to match, otherwise you vanish. So that's the delta function. 
we can apply matrices, multiply matrices A times B. So basically, we represent the matrix A with the tensor network and represent the matrix B with the tensor network. And this matrix multiplication is a contraction of the lag, so we end up getting the new matrix. So this is equal to a box of matrix A times B. Yes, that's the multiplication. Let's do a little more things. How to represent trace of row, okay? So row is going to be some box with the two lags. And trace means we are summing over these two lags when they are equal to one another. So we are just contracting them and this is a diagram. Okay, so in other words, tracing operator can be represented as these component. And the row is row and tracing row is just a contract in those tensor network. Okay. So let's consider a reduced density matrix. Suppose I want to get a reduced density matrix by tracing out a bar from some quantum state psi psi. How to represent this? We represent psi by this. And it's a bipartite system. Maybe we have our A and A bar, so with two lags. We have a bra vector, a cap vector, and the bra vector, which is psi and with two lags, that corresponds to A and A bar. The trace out, but only partial trace out, we contract A bar part, so we just contract this guy, and with this uncontracted guy, that's row A. So this is basically the same as row A. Is everything clear so far? Okay, and the final example. Let's compute properties such as rho square. This is called a purity. Trace of rho is normalized to be one. Trace of rho square could be any value from zero to one. And this is small when rho is mixed. And this is large when rho is near pure. And diagrammatic representation is easy. Basically, you can think of as trace of rho times rho. Therefore, this is rho and row, multiply them, and then trace it out. So this is a diagrammatic representation of trace of row square. So is everything clear so far? Okay, now that we are the masters of tensor network diagrams, and that's all we need to do. So let's go through actual step of deriving the spin model. Step number one. So I'm going to write down the expression. Don't be too scared, it's a little long. But uh, this, I'm going to write down the expression for Sn. So I'm going to define S A N bar to be minus one over A minus one. Okay, so this is my S N bar. So let me unpack what I mean. First of all, this N is an index N. There's a funky things going on when N goes to one. That's why we need to take the limit eventually rather than just directly defining it. And there's a log and there's averaging over unitary gauge, okay? And inside this averaging, we have this object so we have a quantity rho tilde A of M raised to the power of N. So we take the trace of that, okay? And then sum over M. The M is going to the measurement trajectory. So we need to know what this rho tilde means. So rho tilde uh, M is defined as our previous unnormalized wave function psi of M. So this also depends on the unitary, but I'm just dropping that dependence. This all normalized wave function for the particular trajectory, and we can correspondingly define the density matrix. Now, row A of M tilde 
is defined as partial trace of, a, of this row. So we literally get this wave function and trace out, so it's literally partial density matrix, it's not normalized. So if you compute the trace of rho tilde am, we obtain the probability of getting that particular measurement trajectory history, and that's what I'm going to write as a p of m. And also that p of m is this p of m. Okay? And we are summing over all different measurement trajectories, and then we have averaging and the logarithms and they normalize this quantity. I, sorry. Yeah. Absolutely, that's right. So if I use the normalized wave function, we'll get the normalized density matrix. I'm taking all normalized wave functions, so your all normalized density matrix. But trace of rho tilde is just the norm of this state. Therefore, it's a probability. Sorry? This is not equal to one. This is a probability of getting a particular measurement history M. It can be anything between zero. It's, it's going to be actually exponentially small because there are exponentially many different you know, measurement outcomes over the multiple layers of circuit. So individual p-value will be exponentially small. Yes? We'll do that now. Yeah, we'll do that. So let's check that this actually reproduces the, the, the relevant quantity, yes. No, sorry? Uh, this EN, that's a typo, this EU. Thank you, that's right. Rows of A? That's right, because that's the same. This is also the same as trace of rho tilde. So, I mean, the rho of A is just a partial trace, and then trace the rest component. So this is tracing over A part. Okay, okay cool. So why is it reproducing, um, you know, reproducing the desired quantity? Let's quickly derive it. So, like, I'll do the calculation pretty quick, because it's a bit technical, but it's worth following it. Uh, and it's a popular technique in, in many fields, not only in these measurement induced phase conditions, but also in many of the spin glass problems where we cannot compute like, logarithm efficiently. So one beauty of this is this. So we perform averaging over unitary here, inside a log, right? So once you compute everything inside a log, you don't need to take any logarithms. And in fact, this is just rho to the power n. So it's a kind of a monomial of the rho. That's something we can calculate easily and perform averaging. And then apply nonlinear function, which is log. However, in a way that if you take the limit and goes to one, it reproduces the quantity where averaging is done outside of log. And I want to show you that. Because that's kind of like very useful and um, you know, relevant. So, just for the record, this whole thing is what I'm going to define as a ZA for N, and this quantity is what I define as Z of N, and that's the partition function that I described for the spin model, with the two different boundary conditions. And boundary condition will come from difference between rho A tilde versus PM. In fact, if you choose A to be nothing, partial trace is basically tracing out everything, Right? Then we get the PM. So actually these two terms can be understood as different choice of A. That's why we have a different choice of the top boundary condition, where in one case A is just nothing. Everywhere is positive. Okay, okay so let's derive it quickly. So let's see what happens when N goes to one. First thing first things to notice is that the denominator goes to zero. 
so this diverges. However, actually that's okay because when n is to one, rho tilde to the n is one, at the rho to the n, so it's a trace of rho. So this quantity is p of m, right? And this is also p of m because it's just like you know n equal one. And averaging over unitary, averaging unitary, they are exactly the same quantity. So these quantity actually cancel each other. So the numerator is also zero, right? So the denominator and the numerator both vanishes. Therefore, we can evaluate. We should evaluate this by taking the derivative of both numerator and the denominator. The derivative of numerator, uh, denominator in n is just one. So I'll skip that calculation. And we only need to evaluate the you know derivative of the top components. Okay. So limit n goes to one. S a of n bar is equal to minus derivative with respect to n. Let's only consider this component because the second component will look very similar. We'll make a derivative, we have a log function, so what we are going to get is expectation value of u Actually, we have a derivative but we have our expectation value of u and then summation we can, we can exchange because that's a linear operation. Do you agree with this expression? Please correct me if I'm wrong because you know, sometimes if you are standing in front of the blackboard, you know, your, your IQ drops by one order of magnitude. So, like, so it's, I, I, I easily make mistakes, so tell me if I'm wrong. I believe this is true, and then we need to handle making a derivative here. But here, let's do this calculation. So basically, you want the derivative of something x to the n, right? You can understand this, the derivative of e to the n log x, okay? And evaluate n equal one. Evaluate n equal one, and that's equal to log x times e to the n log x. Evaluate n equal one, which is x log x. Okay, so we can do that, and that's why this rule give you the factor average over unitary sum over m. We have rho a of m tilde log rho a of m tilde. And in the denominator, so we already evaluated n equal one. Denominator n equal one, this is basically rho tilde and then trace, that's a p of m. You sum over all m and probably adds up to one, so it's one. So we don't even have to calculate averaging over unitary, just one. Right, so constant is average over, so like there's no denominator here. Okay, cool, and then there's the minus sign coming from here. Okay, and here we have a term with the negative sign, basically the same term when rho a is replaced by pm. So that quantity is going to be average over u, or I just pull out this averaging and put it here, minus p of m log P of M. Okay? And final things to notice is that rho A of M tilde can be normalized. We know it's a trace is equal to P of M, so what we are going to do is pull out P of M and write, introduce a normalized version of rho tilde, right? And then replace this rho tilde with this p times rho and p times rho. And what goes into the inside the log will factorize with the component p and the log p and the log rho. The log, comp log p component will cancel with this guy because, oh sorry, I'm missing trace here. Trace. Because we are tracing over rho and then we have another p and that will precisely cancel so after cancellation, we will get the desired quantity of averaging over u 
minus sum over m um, trace of p of m times rho of m log rho of m. And this is precisely what we wanted to have. Okay. So the lesson is, it's not so complicated calculation. The lesson is, the log factor is now inside the averaging over unitary. How did it happen? Because we are making derivative with respect to n, but that derivative is bringing log factor from this guy, and that's already inside the averaging. So that's why the log factor can be pulled out. And this is the, the, if you want to learn more about it, this is a replica tree. Okay, any questions? To. That's right, just standard L'Hopital rule. So why, like the, so this whole thing is the numerator and goes to zero when n equals to one. Sorry? Denominator is one or n minus one here. So it goes to zero when n equals to one. Yeah, the, you factorize this guy into two of these. And then you have a trace which act, acting on this row copy, and that gets PM. That cancels this guy, right? That's why you have PM here. So this is literally averaged quantity. Okay, good so far. So we learned about replica trick, and then let's go to step two. So we want to write down the tensor metric diagram. So let's remind ourselves how the pure state psi m look like if you draw in the circuit diagram. Circuit diagram is a version of tensor metric diagram, so it's good. So let's have, for now, like six qubits, zero, zero, everywhere. And then we apply some unitary u1, unitary u2, unitary u3, and maybe unitary u4, unitary u5, Dot, dot, dot. Based on some other unitary here to the left, some other unitary to the right. And this is a tensor network diagram. Yeah, dot, 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 dot. This is a tensor network diagram for our pure state psi of m in the absence of any measurement. Okay, let's introduce some measurement. Okay, I perform the measurement here. And therefore, I obtain some measurement outcome, say M1. And that's equal to inserting a projector M1, M1. So you should project to the state M1, and then state is in that state P1, okay? And maybe you don't measure this guy, but maybe you measure another guy here. M2, M2. So it's a projector inserted there. So we probabilistically choose certain sites and insert the you know, measurement outcome, you know, you know, the projection the measurement. That psi of m tilde, all normalized, okay? This is two complicated diagrams. I'm going to just simplify by saying RUC plus measurement. So whenever you see this diagram, you just should imagine this whole thing, just you know, shrunken in this way, and then we have many legs, we have many legs. Inside there's a, you know, like here and there are some projectors associated with the measurement outcome. So this depends on the choice of u. This object depends on the measurement outcome m, okay? So how do we write down a density matrix rho of m? Very simple. You have this the same thing. 
copy down, but it's a bra vector, so you need to take a complex conjugation. And that's this. So this diagram is basically RUC plus measurement with the lags and lags. And here we are just contracted to all zero. And we have another box, RUC, let me put star here. Name means complex conjugation. Otherwise, everything the same. If U1 appears here, exactly the same U1 appears here with the star, with the complex conjugation. So they are correlated now. So individual U here are uncorrelated random unitary, but same U appears in two different boxes. They are perfectly correlated unitary because we are considering identical copy for a given set of U's and measurement outcome. RUC star for the measurement. And here we have an input state that's a bra vector of zeros rather than cap vector of uh, zeros. And then output lags. Okay. And let, let's now try to, it's a tilde, then unnormalize. And suppose we want to do the partial trace of this row tilde so that we get the reduced density matrix for the unnormalized reduced density with the A part. That means we need to trace out a, a, a complement. So let's divide the system into half. Say this is A and this is A bar, and half, so this is A and A bar. We are going to contract the indices on the A bar one at a time for every qubit. So that's going to be a contraction of this line. And you should be careful about the ordering. The, the same qubits are contracted because we are just tracing out the degrees of freedom. And this diagram is already complicated, so I'm going to compress them by having double rectangle. So we have uh, these two things lying on top of each other. And then now every side we have uh, two legs where one from cat vector and one from the bra vector. So the initial state is zero, zero here and zero, zero here, dot, dot, dot. And this is RUC measurement, tensor RUC star measurement. Just two copies of this box on top of each other. And then we have uh, two lines per site, one from bra vector and then one for the cat vector. Know? And then we are tracing it out only for the part A, till a, a bar, complement of A. And this A part is left uncontracted. And this represents all normalized reduced density matrix of rho. Okay. And finally, we are talking about n equal 2 case, the special case of n equal 2. Uh, we want to evaluate rho A tilde square. Yeah, measurement record M is encoded by different choice of locations of inserting the, the projectors, and zero and one. So that's all inside this box. Okay. Okay. How do we compute rho a tilde square, and then we want to take the trace of this quantity? That's what we want, right? Remember, so far here, this is a matrix. Therefore, we have uncontracted lags, open lags. This. It's a number, which is one real number. So we won't be, we will not have any uncontracted lag, but everything will be contracted. How do we do that? Simple. We just copy these twice, and then contract them exactly the same way we have done here. Okay. So use your imagination, and I'm going to just draw the final results. That's going to be. We have four boxes. So RUC measurement, RUC star measurement, RUC measurement, RUC star measurement, like four copies of the same tensors. So inside each U appears four times, U, U star, U, U star, like four times. All the measurement copies happens at four times, M1, 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 M1. And every qubit is now associated with four lines, one, two, three, four. First two is from the first copy bracket. Second two is the second copy bracket. So if I write like zero, zero, Tensor zero zero, and that's the initial state. Some some initial state. Four lines: one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So that's the initial tensors. 
And then on the top, we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let me only draw 4. Here, we contract in this way. So what you see is within copy, say copy 1, we are contracting by themselves. A copy 2 will be contracted by themselves. So contraction will look like this. Okay. However, for the A part, our contraction will be close to copy. Therefore, this contraction will look like this. And this is part A, and this is part A, A bar. Okay. So already start to see some structure here. So we see the bottom boundary where the tensor-tensor contraction is contracting to the like zeros, like product state. Eventually, there will be, become an open boundary condition for the spin model. Here, we are contracting a particular form of tensors, and that will correspond to pinning the spins. Here, another tensors, and that will correspond to pinning the spin with the negative, you know, different configurations. And we will see that in more detail soon. Okay. So. So that's the, the overall structure. And what remains to do is to let you zoom in and look at what happens in the bulk of these tensors. So any questions until then? So everything is clear? Okay, so let's do that. So if you zoom in this box, like four copies of the box, we basically have two components here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. I didn't draw too dot, many dots, but the, everything has to be contracted to product state zero. So there's, it's not an open lag. You have contracted a particular state, product state. I just deleted, but uh, you know, the product state, yeah. So if you zoom in this RUC box, <clears throat> we have a two components. So now, now it's like step th three. We are going to perform averaging. So if you zoom in, every U, U, and their complex conjugate U star, and U, and U star appears as a, you know, as a four copies always together. So to simplify this, I'm going to draw again just one box. U tensor U star, U tensor U star, I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So remember, a single U is acting on two qubits, left qubit and the right qubit, input, output. So here, we have a left qubit, right qubit, input, output. Copy one, copy two, within copy one, cat bra, cat bra. So I think everything's clear. So we have many legs, it's how many, like 16 legs. What we want to do is we want to average over this quantity over all choice of unit tray. So for, why do we rearrange in that diagram? Because I want the same use to be on top of each other because they are perfectly correlated, so they have to be averaged together. However, each U appearing at the different part of the circuit are identical and independently distributed. So each of them can be evaluated separately. So in the bulk, we will have to evaluate this quantity and I'll do it later. Another component is a measurement component. So whenever we perform measurements, we basically project to the M, say M1, and do the same projection for the next line, M1, and the same projection and same projection. Okay. So these four lines are basically do those four lines I just expanded. And we need to sum over this M. Okay. So we do need to sum over M. We are not evaluating P over M. So just diagrammatically, we are just summing over the projectors. All the, and that's possible because we, because we are basically utilizing tensor networks. We just average at the level of diagrams without having to evaluate all the quantities. And summing over M 
is basically an object that I'm going to draw like this. So this means I just define this object by this. There's a one index m, and it runs from one through d. In our case, d equal two, so one or two is zero or one. And whenever this is zero, all the indexes is non, you know, it, it, the index has to be zero, otherwise it vanishes. So this is a simple tensor network diagram. So you just copy tensor. The single classical variable, m equal, you know, zero and one, we'll just copy. So let's say zero and one, I guess. Zero or one. And that, that's, the, the, basically it means that eight of the legs has to take the same value, and that value could be either zero or one. Okay, that's this tensor. So measurement can be taken care of in this way. Remember, we perform measurement or not with a certain probability Q, and they'll handle that later. Let's talk about this one. So this one has nothing to do with our specific problem. This is exactly just some mathematical object where you take four copies of unit tray and consider their moment, their, their, their averaging over unit tray. This quantity is called the second moment. Um, or depending on the community, there's a, you know, sometimes it's fourth moment. Because second moment, because we always have a U and U dagger pair as a pair. So we, the second moment means that you have two pairs of pairs. So it's second moment, the four mo fourth moment, because we have a power four in unit tray. Any question? So each box contains many unit trays. within the box. And we will have a many averaging. Here we are averaging over U1, for example, U1 over there. We will do the averaging over U2, U3, U4, all separately and independently. Okay. So let's do this averaging. So this derivation is not so difficult, but let me just write down the answer. U, U star, U, U star. This averaging is what, what makes a unit, random unit tree very useful. Turns out this can be written in the following ways. Sum over some classical label for a variable sigma, which could be either plus or minus. This plus minus is the label that I came up with. Like, you know, you just label like zero, one, plus or minus, you know, it doesn't matter, red or blue, you know, it's you know, okay. And then sum over tau, which, uh, which is another classical variables like plus minus. And then there's a diagram. And I, I associate a label to the diagram because I'm going to talk about two different diagrams. Tau diagram, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And sigma diagram, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So this means we are summing over four different diagrams, sigma plus minus one, tau plus minus one. But we weight them by some coefficient, and this coefficient has a name, sigma and tau, and also it depends on local Hilbert space dimension of this unit tray, or let's just be explicit, the dimension of unit tray. And this coefficient is called the Weingarten function. And for the, uh, <clears throat> For Weingarten, and it's just a particular function that I can write down now. Sigma tau is equal to one over d squared. This okay, okay. Let's say yeah, dim square minus one. If sigma and tau are equal, and minus one dim times dim square minus one. If sigma is not equal to tau. So we have four, four diagrams to be summed over, and coefficient depends on the relation between sigma and tau. Okay? And averaging over tensors leads to the summation over tensors, where each term contributing to the summation can be enumerated by the variable sigma and tau. So when sigma is equal to plus, this diagram is a particular tensor and that particular tensor looks like this. So what it means is, 
these indices have to be the same, otherwise it vanishes. And these indices have to be the same, otherwise it vanishes. But these index and these indices need not be correlated. The same is true. These pair have to be the same, this pair has to be the same, but crossing doesn't have to be the same. That's the contraction rule of this particular tensor, and it's the sigma plus tensor. We have a sigma minus tensor, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's this diagram. So that means the first, first and the fourth has to be paired, second and third, and same here. And tau tensors are, they look the same. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Plus case is equal to this. And tau minus case is equal to this. That's right. So the question was, where does, what determines this function? This function is determined by the distribution over which we are averaging over unit tray. So we are assuming that we are averaging over high random uniform distribution in the unitary space. If we average over different space, this entire result on the right could be different. It's just not just modifying the tensor you know, coefficient, it'll be just different. So what we should do is we apply this rule, this averaging rule, locally to every unit trace that appears in this large box. And also we apply this rule for every measurement and that uh, apply to the box. But before go doing there, let's, let's build up a little bit of intuition. Suppose I have uh, two copies of density matrix row and then contract with sigma plus tensor. For example, like this portion of sigma plus tensor. And that looks like this. And that's equal to trace of row, whole thing squared. Okay? But if you have a copy of tensor like row and row, and then contract with the, say, sigma equal minus case, that's like contracting in this way. That's equal to trace of row squared. It's a purity. Okay? So this identity component, uh, this plus component, is sometimes called identity. It's just tracing out whatever the whatever things that are coming in. And this minus component is called a swap component in the literature. Why? Because you can understand in this way. So we have a two lags, bra cat, and a cat bra, cat bra. I'm going to exchange the cat component and then trace. And this is equal to one another. So you swap and then contract. And this way we can compute the purity. And this way we can compute the nonlinear entities that are nonlinear in row, and that allows us to compute the entanglement entropy eventually. Okay. So our n, so there was a question about what detects, like what, what's the meaning of n. Here we have an n equal two. That means the quantity we are evaluating is nth monomial of the density matrix. So here we are only talking about the second moment. If you go to the higher moment, like nth moment, we will have a two n unitaries, like two n, uh, n pairs of you know, unitary, and then we can apply the same rule, and basically we get exactly the same formula. However, sigma and tau will be enumerated by permutation entries, how n copies are permuted. Similar to here, so it's just either tracing versus swap and tracing. But if you have three copies, there are more combinations to permute them. Like it's swap the first two or the second and third, or like cyclically permute, there are six different combinations. So sigma and tau will run over the entries of permutation group of entity n. N equal two case that happen to be just identity swap only. And why Garten function has to be suitably modified according to that. But that one you can just look up the textbook, like math textbook, and then look up the table, and then you get the matrix. So that's the meaning of large N. So we are, by choosing N equal two, we are taking some minimum components that allows us to compute the nonlinear uh, the quantities in row. Good. OK. 
suspicious. That's a very good point. So if you want to compute out of time order correlators, what happens is you have a forward evolution and backward evolution and forward evolution and backward evolution. You have four copies of U. Just draw the tensor-electric diagram according to this. This U star can be understood as a backward evolution. Draw the diagram and insert the operators. In OTOC case, it will be one operator on the bottom and then one operator on the top, average of unitary and you will get exactly the same spin model. In fact, like, you know, historically, this technique was used to compute the development of entanglement entropy over time and exact calculation of OTOC in the random unitary circuit, even before this measurement induced phase transition was discovered. The new component is, in some sense, like new component relevant to the measurement induced you know, phase transition is basically adding this measurement component. And turns out, this introducing this component has a tuning knob which corresponds to tuning the temperature of the spin model. Because without this, we have just one spin model without any parameters. But now we have a parameters. And that allows us to do the phase transition. OK, cool. So let's stitch them together. Let's combine everything together. Um, <clears throat> this is the original circuit diagram, so I'm going to keep it as it is. This is basically four copies overlaid on top of each other. Let's zoom in a part of this diagram. Remembering the geometry looks like this. So the four copy version of this will look like this. After averaging over unitary, each U, four copies of U, will split it into sigma and tau. Therefore, we'll have a diagram that looks like sigma, tau, sigma, tau, sigma tau for these three unitaries, and then sigma tau, sigma tau, sigma tau. I'm, I'm kind of matching them so that we can compare them each other. Tau, and we have four lines, one, two, three, four, and the, here top, the bottom boundary condition is basically they all have to be zero. It's very similar to measurement, but not summing over M, it's just like all zero. And here, one, two, three, four, all zero. And then we have all these connections where four lines, and four lines, and they new they contracted together because this is contracted. However, we have a measurement inside. So measurement tensor look like this after summing over M. So this contraction will be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and there's a value m, and we are going to sum over m. Um, <clears throat> here, we have a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, I guess you get the point, right? Maybe I don't have to draw the whole thing. So you just evaluate this whole diagram. And then what? We need to sum over set of sigmas and set of taus. And then this whole thing is weighted by <clears throat> uh, Weingarten function, uh, omega of g, sigma and tau, for every pairs of unitaries. So you need to multiply them. And that's the weight associated with them, right? So what I see is already something that looks like a partition function. You have a classical variable that's a plus minus and assign the configurations. Once assigned the configurations, this is a product of the weight and this is determined by local configuration of pairs of sigma and tau. Only remains to evaluate this diagram. However, this diagram is very simple because what a given, for a given assignment of sigma, plus, sigma and tau variable, say we have a plus and minus, we have a certain assignment of sigma and tau, and those diagrams will factorize because we have a left and a right that's factorizing this way. So this part 
and this part will factorize. Furthermore, the diagram will be very easy to compute, for example, sigma equals plus and tau equals minus, and if you look at the, this particular component, that's equal to contracting a diagram that looks like this. And this diagram is basically a loop. And loop is actually summing over indexes. And if the dimension is two, this is evaluated to dimension two. Because, let, let's recap, so if you have a line, it's identity, it's, a, it's identity matrix. And if you do this, that's a tracing over identity, which is the dimension of the identity, so this is a dimension. In this case, we have a one loop. However, if sigma is, for example, minus, and tau is also minus, we get a different diagram, namely, we have a diagram that looks like this. We have two loops, so we have a d square, which is four. Okay? So what happens is, depending, in fact, we can just fill out the computation, and depending on they are equal or not, it's either four or two, it's d square or two. They have a higher weight when they are equal. That means every pair, you look at the weight and define this weight as some diagonal weight that depends on sigma and tau in the absence of, you know, with no measurement. And then this weight is higher when this configuration is the same. That means there's a ferromagnetic interacting. The fact that it only depends on their relative relation, equal or not, means it's an Ising symmetry. Plus, plus, and minus, minus are not distinguishable. Okay? In the case we have a measurement, we can also evaluate the diagram. And you will see that in this case, it's four versus two, but if you have all contract, it's always two. Uh, that means regardless of whether they're equal or not, they take the same value. And you can see that because once you have diagram, it doesn't matter you contract in this way or this way because they all have to the same value and this whole value evaluates to this D, or in our case, two. So in this picture, we have a ferromagnetic coupling for every pair on the diagonals. And we have a Weingarten function for every pair on the vertical. And whenever we perform measurements, we are weakening the ferromagnetic interaction. What we could do, we, we define average over whether you perform measurement or not, and then evaluate the average of the weight between these two cases. So in the, in the case of measurement, the weight is independent of their relation. No measurement they have a ferromagnetic coupling. So if you tune the Q, average weight will interpolate between those two. Because of that, eventually, this whole quantity, which I define as you know, Z, this whole thing as Z, will be the following, like Z A will be sum over variables for sigma and tau's and product over this diagonal component of the sigma and tau that depends on Q, and product over all this Weingarten function, sigma and tau. And then finally, we have a top boundary conditions, where top boundary condition can be understood as basically plus, spin, plus configuration and minus configuration. Just look at the diagrams, it's identical. And different subsystem choice, A or nothing, dictates top boundary conditions to be like, how much would be the positive and negative. So there's one problem. I'm sorry, I'm already over time, but let me try to wrap up. There's one problem, which is that this Weingarten function has a negative value uh, in, in their components. By the way, here I use a dim instead of D, because this should be the dimension of the unitary, which is D squared if the D is a local Hilbert dimension. It's a two qubit gauge. So, <clears throat> uh, so you just put the D square here. So it's a D to the four minus one. Um, this negative weight is problem because that means for certain configuration, um, our Boltzmann weight contains a negative weight and that doesn't really have interpretation as a classical spin model. And that problem persists if, uh, uh, that problem is really serious when n is larger than three, uh, larger than equal to uh, three. However, in the special case n equal two, we have a one way to eliminate that sign problem. 
One way is here, we have a classical variable that's a sigma and tau, but we can explicitly integrate it out tau degrees of freedom. So if you integrate at the tau degrees of freedom, you basically induce three-body interaction among them and get the triangle interaction. And it turns out that triangle interaction still respects the Ising symmetry because you know, this integration will not change the Ising symmetry. However, now there's no sign problem. We can eliminate the sign problem. And that's how we eventually obtain the classical spin models, the you know, different boundary conditions, and uh, uh, like, thankfully, like, you know, we already talked about the interpretation of you know, classical spin model to do measurement in this phase transition. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah, question. A and A bar, well, that's, that's quite different. So what I'm doing is, I'm using this particular identity. This is identity. So th this is an important identity uh, well of random unitary circuit. So we are performing averaging at the diagrammatic level for each unitary, and that gives us the splitting into the tau part and the sigma part. Sorry? These, these, yeah, these will eventually become the classical degrees of freedom. I don't know if they have a name, yeah. Right, yes? That's right, yeah, thank you for asking that. So, so the quantity we are evaluating I, I told you, I should have mentioned that I, the, this SA2 bar involves averaging over you know, measurements and also Rennie entropy. It looks like similar to Rennie entropy, but I told you that it's not. The reason being, this is A averaged inside a log, so that's one difference. And furthermore, you are averaging over P of M square and you know, trace of rho a m squared. Previously, I wrote it as an unnormalized wave function, but if you rewrite it in the normalized wave function, normalized density matrix, we are, we are computing something like purity, that's okay. However, we are weighting them by probability square. That means, relatively speaking, you are weighting more, uh, you are giving more weight than you should for the more likely measurement outcome, and this skews the statistical properties. In the limit n goes to one, this will be fixed. However, that's the reason why this, you have a, you know, we do not trust the universality of behavior of these guys will be the same for the universality behavior of the original model. So the more technically, you know, this does not capture the typical behavior because this will be dominated by a few instances that happen to have a large probability. That's right. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Maybe you're right. Yeah, I don't I don't know about this. Ah, I see, well, okay, so I don't know the answer to your exact question, but this particular classical spin model, you can exactly compute the critical point analytically. So it turns out there's a little, this particular model hasn't been studied, so what's going to happen is a triangle interaction will be the combination of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic interaction, but overall the net the ferromagnetic interaction, even though naive coupling is like, has different sign. And that particular model hasn't been studied in the literature, so we can just quote, quote the value. Yeah. Okay.
Absolutely, that's the that's the how the community is moving and uh, has moved. For example, here the magnetization is an order parameter. So what we want to do is, for example, two point correlation function, two point long distance correlation function that we want to evaluate. And how does it translate to the random circuit model? Turns out it has an interpretation. Rather than just doing random entry circuit, you bring some extra ancillary degrees of freedom and couple to the system and study how the purity of this, you know, this particular ancilla changes after a long time. So that kind of situation is you know, meaningful in quantum information theory, but originally motivated by the, this type of calculation. But at the same time, you, you should recognize that eventually we are measuring free energy difference coming from the boundary domain walls, right? That's conceptually super clear, but obviously that's not local order parameter. Right, that's not local quantity, because like it's a, so that's what why we could con, you know capture the non-local behavior. Maybe no more question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks.